Well, it says that I am live. And I am live. Here I am uh, talking to you from Montana. Let me readjust this here. <clears throat> okay, hopefully I'm, I'm looking right at you. Now I know this is Easter Sunday. This morning you got up, you went and did your services, you had your Easter egg hunts and your little uh, Easter bunny baskets. And uh, now, hey, Freckle Joy, you're the first in the room. Welcome. Good to see you. <laughs> so now that the uh, Easter hoo-ha is passed, it's time to get back to it. And here we have Johnny Side. All right. All right. Johnny Side and Freckle Joy. They know where it's at. They know where to be at this time on Sunday afternoon. So welcome. <clears throat> As more people um, fall into the room here by the dozens, I'll give you an update. I am here in Kalispell, Montana. Now, I've been here before. About 10 years ago, um, I uh, was interviewed on and featured in... Uh, a travel channel series, National Park Mysteries. We have Fractal Dust Bear. Hello, Fractal. <laughs> and they uh, brought myself and Joseph Farrell up here to Kalispell, Montana, right outside of Glacier National Park. And this is where I'm at for probably, well, at least another couple of weeks. And hello, B. Baker. And so we're here for a few reasons. Um, this is where Malia uh, is from. And uh, she had to come up here to, to take care of some property business. She owns some property up here. And so we figured while she had to do that, I might as well join her and we can do some field research. Now, um, as far as the uh, hello to Ontario, Canada. Uh, let's see, I gotta have my reading glasses on to read the names. <clears throat> but um, I'll catch up with all you guys later. You're gonna have to live with the volume as it is because I don't have a microphone set up. This is all on my phone, obviously. So uh, it's like the old days of the Walter Bosley channel, right? So anyway, um, we came up here and uh, it's giving me the opportunity to check out some places uh, uh, associated with research for one of the Esoteric Napoleon volumes and also other stuff that I'm researching. And those of you who have read um, Empire of the Wheel and Sesheries, The Handprint of Atlas, will know that Glacier National Park is a site of a huge intersection of multiple Tellur current lines. It's also a hotbed for UFO activity and um, post-war uh, Nazi presence as well. So it, uh, it looks to be really interesting. <coughs> uh, over the next couple of weeks, I've already gone out and taken a little bit of a look around You'll be seeing more photos of interesting places posted um, as the days go on. But uh, so far, so good. This is a beautiful state. If you've never been to Montana, I recommend that you uh, definitely come visit. So let me get some water here. <coughs> anyway, a... Uh, Another thing that uh, has happened since I did the last live stream, which was an excellent California episode with uh, Todd Wood, but last week, in fact, the day before we left to come up here, the day before we got on the plane, uh, I released finally the return of Lost Continent Library Magazine. As you guys know, I posted, you know, uh, an announcement about that. Now, this is me bringing back the original Lost Continent Library magazine. That's why it's called Lost Continent Library Magazine Classic, or Lost Continent Library Classic. Now, the first issue is 
um, a reprint of some of the best of the issues that ran in the first volume. Starting with the next issue, there's going to be new material, okay? Um, we're going to have something written by David J. West, all right? He was an excellent uh, writer of westerns and, and spooky stuff and fantasy and horror. Um, I, I'm really excited that uh, David is enthused to be contributing to the magazine. There's going to be new um, articles on uh, classic adventure films and literary figures and, and uh, you know, you name it. But uh, go check it out. Now, it's not that expensive. It's only a buck ninety nine. And I got to tell you, a lot of work went into the first volume. And a lot of work goes into these things. So this whole enterprise, Lost Continent Library, being my source of income, you know, I got to charge a little something for my time. Because like you guys, I have bills to pay and groceries to buy. And I think I told you a couple of weeks back that uh, just because you sell the rights for uh, TV development doesn't make you rich right off the bat. So <laughs> anyway, um, you'll see the time and the care and the attention and the creativity that goes into the magazine. And many of you read the books and you already know how hard I work to do the books. So um, buck ninety nine for the magazine. It is a PDF download, but... Um, uh, we are going to offer also a printed magazine uh, soon that's going to have different um, content in it as well. But go check out Lost Continent Library Magazine Classic um, and give yourself a break from the news of the day. You need to do that. We all need to do that. We're going to hear that anyway. We're going to be concerned about it anyway. Give yourself a little break once in a while. I like to think that's why you come here to the Walter Bosley channel, um, is to give yourself a break from the usual, right? Turn off the TV news. Turn off the pundits uh, for a while, at least one day a week. Give yourself a break. So um, th there, there's that. Check out Lost Content Library magazine. It is at Lulu. Now, um... Let's see, are there any more announcements? No, not off the top of my head. I, I can't think of any other than, for those of you who are just coming in the room, I'm in Montana um, for the next couple of weeks. Been here since Wednesday, and uh, you'll be seeing me post more and more stuff. We're going to do some cool um, GSI, Grim Scene Investigation, Paranormal investigations for uh, Malia's radio show and her YouTube and uh, we'll both be doing our radio shows from here. Remember, our radio shows are at independent-broadcasting.com. And hers is uh, Sunday nights, tonight, at um, 9 p.m. to midnight Pacific time, even though we're in Montana physically. And mine's on Friday nights from 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. Pacific time. And uh, that's those are our radio shows. But we're going to be doing um, some GSI stuff at some haunted locations here in Montana that she's told me about. And some uh, to lurk current hotspots, UFO hotspots, Sasquatch hotspots, crypto stuff. I mean, you, you name it. And of course, I'm going to be doing, um, uh, as I have been already, some secret missions uh, series research. Um, and uh, specifically, one of the Napoleon volumes uh, involves Montana, believe it or not. So, that's one of the reasons why we're here. Anyway, let's see how many... Uh... Wow. Hopefully, uh, the, the, the signal's going good. And you guys can hear me, because this is what you get. It's going to be the phone. It's the way this has got to work. So this week, the subject, Talbot Mundy, Lost Technology, and the Missing Gold. Folks, this is a doozy. Now, I've been telling you, I've been telling you, pay attention 
to the fiction that I publish and the fiction I, I know I know I've told you the fiction I write um, is definitely influenced by and includes my nonfiction research okay but I know right now everybody's into this it's it's got to all be nonfiction it's got to be all real it's got and, you know, meanwhile you know half the stuff going around that purports to be real is bullshit and we all know that okay so um, what have you got to lose? You know, a, a lot of the stuff that you see, not here, I hope, but a lot of the stuff you see, you know, on YouTube and you hear on the radio shows in our community and stuff, you know, that, that might as well be labeled fiction because there's people out there making bullshit up. So why not when a nonfiction researcher whom you trust um, recommends certain fiction for you to check out, why not do it? Okay. And Talbot Mundy is a case in point. Now, Mundy, um, he earned his fame as a pulp adventure, mystical adventure author uh, during the 1920s. Um, <clears throat> and he is, as you've heard me talk in the past, really the source of, um, you know, the kind of adventure, the retro adventure we know today, primarily through the Indiana Jones movies. That's the kind of stuff that Talbot Mundy uh, mastered and became popular for, and really mastered that particular subgenre, okay? And, um, it, it, you know, The Man Who Would Be King, that, that is a Rudyard Kipling story, but uh, that's the kind of stuff that Talbot Mundy liked himself and would write. So, um, you know, you're familiar with Talbot Mundy, whether you recognize his name or not, all right? So let me uh, shift here in this chair. Sorry about that. I had to shift up there and get a close-up that you didn't want. So, as you guys know, let me grab this other book so that I'm not reaching up too much in your faces. As you guys know, um, through my company, I've recently released four reprint editions of Talbot Mundy books, novels, okay? And two of them are Caves of Terror and The Nine Unknown. This is Talbot Mundy on the back here. Now, I publish these for multiple reasons. Yes, I uh, my label is a classic adventure label, and so Mundy's one of the masters. It's a natural that I would publish uh, Mundy under the LCL Lost Conant Library imprint, which is my fiction imprint, Corvos being my nonfiction imprint. Now, these two books in particular really resonate with things that we're interested here, both here at the Walter Bosley Channel and in the uh, general community, okay, of alternative research. Caves of Terror, let me make sure I'm getting this right, was a novel that... Um, published in 1922. Now, originally, originally, it was published, I think, partially as a serial uh, by Doubleday Page and Company in 1922, its first year of printing, and then Garden City Publishing um, in 1924, okay? Lost Continent Library reprint edition, 2022. Of course, that's, that's my company. That's this edition here, what I call the white covers. Okay, and in these books, here's the, here's the other one, I'm sorry, The Nine Unknown, okay? Now, it's publishing history, and this is important. There's a reason why I'm sharing with you the, the years that these were published, because this might knock your socks off when we get into talking about what we're going to talk about today. The Nine Unknown, published by Talbot Mundy first in uh, Adventure Magazine, 1923. 
okay? So these books are now 100 years old. Okay. I'm going to share with you information from these two books that totally resonate with this book here by our friend Dr. Joseph Farrell, Babylon's Banksters. Which, by the way, since we're talking about years published, Babylon's Banksters, 2010. 90 years or so after these books were published. <clears throat> Why is Talbot Mundy important for me to be talking about him tonight with you guys when you guys don't give a flying shit about fiction? Or so you've convinced yourselves. Well, I'll tell you why. It's long been my suspicion that Talbot Mundy knew some things and informed his readers through his fiction of these things, gave them clues and hints as to the things he learned during his adventures. Okay? Now, I don't have, gosh darn it, in the book... Winds of the World, which is one of the four. Um, the other two are Winds of the World and the Eye of Zaytun. But in Winds of the World, the first of the Talbot Mundy volumes that I did classic reprint editions on, I include an article which I wrote uh, for Lost Continent Library Magazine in 2008. Okay? And it tells... Um, Talbot Mundy's biography, and you can see that he traveled part of the world, spent some time in India, and um, one of the places he lived was in San Diego, California, and this was a time when he was acquainted with and um, <coughs> hobnobbing with uh, theosophists. Now, if you're familiar with uh, dark journalists' reports on um, the, on theosophy and, and mysticism and such, you will be familiar with, um, <clears throat> oh gosh, I'm doing a brain dump. At, uh, uh, yikes, at Point Loma, there was a place called Loma Land, okay? Sorry, I, I don't know if you guys are seeing the comments coming up on screen, but right now, let me see if I can get those off my screen so that I'm not seeing them as much, it would help me uh, okay, just so I don't see them um, I'm hoping you guys can see them, but it's kind of distracting for me having it, I'm doing this on the phone and um, it's kind of distracting for me to keep seeing that pop up, but um, I'm sure you guys can communicate with each other now Tinsley, okay, uh, her, her name, last name was Tinsley, and she was one of the um, leading theosophists at Loma Land, and um, Talbot Mundy in San Diego in the 1920s is featured in my time travel novel. For those of you who have taken my advice and not ignored the fiction, um, in I Will See You in Time, the main character encounters Talbot Mundy himself while he's in San Diego in 1920-something, maybe 27. And um, so it brings him, you know, a little bit more alive for you. But um, <coughs> Mundy was the kind of guy that he was searching for the answers to the ancient mysteries, specifically the forgotten technologies of the lost civilization, right? And this is evident in a major way in his fiction. And I've selected these two books in particular to share with you that evidence of these interests on his part. <clears throat> so let's, uh, and, and here's what's What's going to jump out at you? Because it jumped out at me as I was reading these books, going through and making my notes over the last couple of weeks. Um, 
Babylon's banksters will come into this discussion because it, it really astonished me how much uh, I now suspect that Talbot Mundy knew about the very things that Dr. Farrell talks about in this book. I think it might even blow his mind. I don't know how familiar he is with Mundy. But uh, let's go to the 1922 Caves of Terror, and let me share with you um, some things that you might be familiar with if you're familiar with, uh, you know, the, the, the discussion in our community and specifically of Dr. Farrell about issues of missing gold and, and ancient technologies. <clears throat> Let us go to... What's interesting about Caves of Terror, it features um, Athelstan King. Now, King is the very same character, King of the Khyber Rifles, another Mundy story, which uh, was turned into a film in the 1940s with Tyrone Power playing King. King is just recently retired from the British Army, and he joins um, the narrator of this story um, in an unexpected adventure. They, they have to go see Yasmini. Now, Princess Yasmini is a character that is legendary among Mundy fans, okay? Um, his big characters that he's known for that appeared in multiple stories of his were Athelstan King, uh, Jim Grimm, the American, um, and uh, Princess Yasmini, <coughs> and there was uh, Jesse or Jeff Ross, I think it's anyway the Australian guy, but he has these returning characters in his stories, and in this one, King goes to see Yasmini, who's got a thing for him, to discuss an issue with her <coughs> that has to do with what the heck is uh, going on in the world. So, uh, in fact, King refers to something goofy going on. Um, the narrator is instructed by uh, Meldrum Strange. Now, Meldrum Strange is kind of the M of the Mundy stories. Now, here's what's interesting. You know, he, he's, his last name is Strange, like Doc Strange, but he predates, Mundy and this character predates Doc Strange by, you know, decades. But they're called to, uh, uh, do, 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 to the, the British Embassy, and um, let's see, uh, da, 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 let's see, that's the fellow who went to the Kinjigan Embassy. Let me get to this one comment when they, they get together. One of the comments that King, Major King, makes is, now this is right after World War I, okay? Uh, you see, he said suddenly, as if a previous conversation had been interrupted, since the war, governments have lost their grip. So I resigned from the army. Governments have lost their grip. What did Mundy mean by that? After World War I, did they lose their grip as in their, their ability to um, maintain control over their nations? Did they lose their grip, um, you know, in, you know in, in their grip on sanity? Or were they losing their grip on power to some rising power of the 20th century? Isn't that an interesting theme there that we can uh, draw from, the inference we can draw from it from our 21st century perspective in this age of, you know, globalist uh, uh, conspiracies and such, for Mundy to have a main character make that comment. Now, I also find it interesting um, in terms of, we're talking context here now. Uh, let's see, uh, this is Yasmini talking to King when King goes to see her in India. You must make terms with me, heaven-born, she went on, changing her tone to one of rather more suggestive firmness. The Kali Yug is drawing to a close, and India awakes. Now, see, that's an ongoing theme from, um, from Yasmini. India awakes. What does that mean? Well, here's some context. 
during World War I, they're here, or, or I say here, I'm in Montana right now, in California, in the years leading up to World War I, there was something called the, the German Hindu Conspiracy. And German intelligence, military intelligence, was working with East Indian, you know, India, their intelligence agents who were all throughout California. Why? Well, um, because uh, there was shipping, okay, that uh, was being done secretly by the Germans to India, that is shipping arms, uh, specifically, if you read about the Annie Larson affair, that's Annie Larson is a ship, um, the German military intelligence was uh, shipping arms to India via San Diego. This was to, to feed the resistance in India to British rule. As, as war was coming on and war had already begun, World War I we're talking about, the Germans naturally wanted to keep England busy on two fronts. So they were feeding the Indian uprising, okay? So the, the, there were agents from India all throughout California because of the, you know, the shipping and the resources and the stuff. And uh, what happened was there was a lot of sabotage going on in San Francisco, Harbor, um, and all up and down the coast. And at the time, there was a trial, a very famous trial, look it up, uh, famous in its day, that was the most expensive uh, court proceeding in United States history up to that time. I talk about this, Rick, and I, Rick Spence and I both talk about this in Empire of the Wheel, Volume 1, The German Hindu Conspiracy, Okay. So th that's a theme that this book touches on. Um, but interesting that the Kali Yuga, right, is mentioned in his book in the 1920s because it's very popular today for, you know, researchers in our community to talk about we are in the, uh, the Kali Yuga. Look that up if you don't know what I'm talking about. Now, um, Yasmini later subsequently says the following... Oh, by the way, she uh, she refers to the narrator, the narrator who's a bit chubby by description as Ganesha. Ganesha, of course, is the elephant-headed, pot-bellied god of of Hinduism. And um, Yasmini says Ganesha is from, uh, Ganesha here is far. Um, let me go back. I know how much is known. This man, what is his name? Ramston Poof. Ganesha here is far better. Ganesha is from America. Those fools who went to prepare the American mind for what is coming, because they were altogether too foolish to be anything but in the way in India, have been found out. Hmm. Those fools who went to prepare the American mind for what is coming. Isn't that interesting? In a Monday novel. Uh, and and uh, Ganesha has come like a big bull buffalo to save the world by thrusting his clumsy horns into things he does not understand. And, and this character represents America. That's what she's saying. Just take the word, the nickname Ganesha out and put America. America has come like a big bull buffalo to save the world by thrusting his clumsy horns into things he does not understand. Yeah in a novel, but go, those of you, go ahead and keep ignoring fiction. I tell you, Athelstan, Yasmini continues, that however much is known, there is much more that is not known. My, my. What was Mundy talking about in 1922 that resonates so well with our times? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. So let's, um, let, oh, in, in this book, what Caves of Terror means is, refers to, is, um, and we're going to get into this, the main characters are unexpectedly put through an ordeal. And in this ordeal, they are taken on this um, ritual journey through a lost subterranean world made by uh, just, uh, some forgotten civilization, not forgotten by certain 
uh, people in India within the context of this story. But we, we'll get to that. Um, now, here's an interesting thing that resonates with something specific in Babylon's Banksters. Let me read to you what's in the 1922 novel Caves of Terror by Talbot Mundy. Once in every hundred years, men have been sent forth to prove by public demonstration that there is a greater science than all that are called sciences. None knew when the end of the Kali Yug might be, and it was thought that if men saw things they could not explain, perhaps they would turn and seek the true mastery of the universe. But what happened? You, who are from America, is there one village in all America where men do not speak of Indians as fakers and mock magicians? For that, there are two reasons. One is that there are multitudes of Indians who are thieves and liars. We're talking East Indians here, folks. Who are thieves and liars who know nothing and seek to conceal their ignorance beneath a cloak of deceit and trickery. The other is that men are so deep in delusion that when they do see the unexplainable, they seek to explain it away. Whereas the truth is that there are natural laws which, if understood by all, would at once make all men masters of the universe. I will give you an example. Today, they are using wireless telephones. They mean radios. Who 20 years ago would have mocked whoever had suggested a thing. 20 years ago, there are those who would have mocked whoever suggested such a thing. Remember, this is 1922. Yet it is common knowledge that 40 years ago, for instance, when Roberts, the British general, led an army into Afghanistan in wintertime and fought a battle at Kandahar, the news of his victory was known in Bombay, a thousand miles away, as soon as it had happened. Now, this is written in the 20s, and it's referring to something that, was, that happened in the 1860s. Yeah, the 1860s. Okay, the battle at Kandahar. And it was known in Bombay, which was a thousand miles away, like it says here, the moment it happened. Hmm, isn't that interesting? I'll continue reading. A thousand miles away as soon as it had happened, whereas the government, the English government, possessing semaphores and telegraphs had to wait many days for the news. Let me, let me go back because I kind of broke that up there. Sorry about that. When Roberts, the British general, led an army into Afghanistan in the wintertime and fought a battle at Kandahar, the news of his victory was known in Bombay, a thousand miles away, as soon as it happened, whereas the British government, possessing semaphores and the telegraph, had to wait many days for the news. How did that occur? Can you explain it? I'm, I'm reading from Monday here, and it goes on. If I were to go forth and tell how it happened, the men who profit by the telegraphs and the deep-sea cables would desire to kill me. There is only one country in the world where such things can be successfully explained, and that is India. That is that is um, what is written in here in Caves of Terror. Now, here's something interesting. They are in one of these lost, forgotten temples when that is discussed. Now, let's go over to Joseph Farrell's Babylon Banksters here. And... Here we have, on page 294, Joseph uh, lays out the reasons for the Banksters' ancient associations with the temple. Now remember, we're, we're um, talking about missing gold, right? Oops. Let's, uh, let's go back to... Um, We're talking about missing gold. Let me, um, so, so that, that implies the banksters is my point. Okay, and we're going to get to the, the, the gold thing. The reasons for the banksters' ancient associations with the temple. 
We are now, at, this is reading from Farrell, we are now at last in a position to see why at least in ancient times one finds the persistent pattern of the presence of bullion brokers or banksters with the temple, for with the astrological and oracular preoccupations of those temples, this would give such a class immediate access to the following. Number one, prediction advanced knowledge of cycles of human activity and emotional responses. Two, communication. Okay, for if Miles' hypothesis should be borne out by subsequent scientific investigation and experiment, access to the temple would have given them access to a means of virtually instantaneous communication across a great part of the world's surface. I will read that again. From Farrell, 2010... Okay, the association of the money people, the banksters, with the ancient temples, okay, and there, there's multiple reasons, but the second one, Farrell List, is communication. For if Mail's hypothesis should be borne out by subsequent scientific investigation and experiment, access to the temple would have given them access to a means of virtually instantaneous communication across a great part of the world's surface. And, um, wait, let me, uh, jump in there for a moment. And there, anyway, there is Talbot Mundy saying the same thing that Joseph Farrell refers to in 2010, but Mundy is saying it in 1922 in a novel, right? And, um... Now, when we're talking about Mayles' hypothesis, we are talking about Dr. Constantine Mayles' paleophysical interpretation of ancient temples as scalar resonators. Hello! You know, I mean, wow. And Mayles' hypothesis... Okay, let, let's, let's jump into this uh, real quickly here. Dr. Constant, Constantine Mayles' paleophysical interpretation if uh, of ancient temples as scalar resonators. If the conception of matter itself is the template or gridwork of the interferences of such longitude, longitudinal standing waves in the medium rationalizes, is capable of rationalizing the placement of certain ancient temples on the surface of the earth, what about the incorporation of sacred geometry into their very dimensions, okay? Um, uh, one scientist who tackled this problem very directly is German physicist and engineer, Professor Dr. Constantine uh, Mayle. Mayle is the author of probably the only comprehensive and highly mathematical textbook treatment of the production of such scalar or longitudinal waves in the medium. The title of Mayle's book, all 654 pages of it, is Scalar Waves, From an Extended Vortex and Field Theory to a Technical, Biological, and Historical Use of Longitudinal Waves. There's a mouthful. And in, in Farrell, uh, Joseph Farrell's referring to that in 2010. And by the way, his book, Constantine Mayle's book, written in 2003, Ancient Temples as, you know, uh, uh, places where longitudinal, scalar physics, folks, associated with longitudinal waves. And... Wait till I continue reading to you from Mundy from a 1922 book. Already, just the communication part um, addresses, and I'll read it again, referring to an 18, a, 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 a battle in the 1860s, okay? Before we had radio, you know? Um, Fought a battle at Kandahar. The news of his victory was known in Bombay a thousand miles away as soon as it had happened. Let's go back to Farrell. A thousand miles away as soon as it had happened is what Mundy wrote in 1922. Farrell writes in 2010, referring to a 2003 hypothesis, reasons for the Bankster's ancient associations with the temple. Uh, it would give them access to, and I'm reading again, communication. For if Mayle's hypothesis should be borne out by subsequent scientific investigation and experiment, access to the temple would have given them access to a means of virtually instantaneous communication across a great part of the world's surface. And Mundy is saying this in 1922, instantaneous communication across a thousand miles in the 1860s. 
from Kandahar to Bombay. And they knew it as soon as it happened. Within, the, within this story, that's what they're saying. Did Mundy know about what Joseph Farrell writes in this book? Did Mundy know about you know what, what led to uh, Dr. Mayle's hypothesis in 2003, almost 100 years later? Hmm, makes you wonder. But hey, all you people that say you don't got time to read fiction, you just go right ahead and ignoring the fiction. <laughs> oh, this is beautiful. I love it. You guys know I love this. And here's another little thing that, that goes on. If I were to go forth and tell how it happened, the men who profit by the telegraphs and the deep sea cables would desire to kill me, right? Because it's just like the guys who come up with automobile engines that run on water, right? The oil companies want them paid off or they want them dead, okay? And, and here, Mundy, through this character, is referring to, you know, what the, the global corporate... Uh, uh, you know, kings of technology, you know, were, were the criminal things they were willing to do, right? To either get the secrets or guard their turf. And um, what's interesting is, Yasmini goes on to say, there is only one country in the world where such things can be successfully explained, and that is India. Now, here's, here's something that, you know, that, that leads me to um, that leads me to ask, this is an interesting question here. Why is India ignored by so many, even by some in our community? Um, even in Babylon's banksters, Rome is talked about, Persia is talked about, Egypt is talked about, the ancient Chaldeans are talked about. India is left out, and yet, and yet, look at the volumes of the the history that you know goes farther back than any other known history. You know, we're talking hundreds of thousands, you know, almost millions of years and such. Um, uh, could India be purposely ignored because truly, that's where these secrets are. Um, I do find the, is the absence of India, is that revealing um, a, a reluctance to look at India, to uh, admit that some of the answers are, are found in India because, I don't know, for, for biases on the part of the researchers, you know, um, I don't know. It, it, to me, it's an interesting question. I, I think that Mundy, like many others who really take an honest deep dive into India, you know, came away and do come away with um, just sensing that a lot of the secrets we're looking for are in India. Now, at one point when they're brought into this subterranean temple world in Caves of Terror, uh, Athelstan King, Major King, King of the Khyber Rifles, um, he tells the narrator, the American narrator, remember that whatever you see is simply the result of something that they know and that we don't. Now, that's a very telling quote in this book. Okay, that, that that's telling you that the character King, Athelstan King, um, he's already onto the idea that what might appear as ancient magic is really just knowledge of a technology that he says it right there plainly. Remember that whatever you see is simply the result of something that they know and that we don't. There you go. Says it straightforward. What he means by that is what we're going to see is we're led through this subterranean world of this ancient temple that's that's beneath, you know, then 1922 India. Um, here now, here we're getting in the, into this interesting technology. The lower hall. I'm reading from Mundy, Caves of Terror. The lower hall was dark, but he found his way without difficulty, picking up a lantern from a corner on his way and then opening a door that gave, underneath the outer marble stairway, onto the court where the pool and the flowering shrubs were. 
The lantern was not lighted when he picked it up. I did not see how he lit it. It was an ordinary oil lantern, apparently, but with a wire, ha with a wire handle to carry it by. But after he carried it for half a minute, it seemed to burn brightly of its own accord. I called King's attention to it. Now, it, isn't that interesting? There's a reference to um, what Harold T. Wilkins certainly cites in his books on the lost South American cities, this, this, this non-fire alternative kind of ancient technology for illumination, right? Well, there's more of it to come in this story. So they're taken into this, this underworld where, um, you know, let me, let me uh, read the description. Okay. We were walking through the heart of masonry whose blocks were nearly black with age. There was a smell of ancient sepulchers, and in places the walls were damp enough to be green and slippery. Presently, we came to the top of a flight of stone steps, each step being made of one enormous block and worn smooth by the sandaled traffic of centuries. Okay. And they go on, they, they go on deeper into this world, and it continues with the description, the pertinent parts here for you. I don't know how long that tunnel was. It was nearly as big as the New York subway, only built of huge stone blocks instead of concrete. There's the megaliths, right? Um, <coughs> we go on um, more description of this subterranean structure. It's just so old and mysterious. We came soon to another flight of steps made of gigantic blocks of stone older than history. Okay? And then here, um, uh, they... Um, we followed the gray Mahatma to a gallery at the top, on the other side of which was a sheer drop and the smell of stagnant water. Now they're underground and there's this sheer drop and it's this megalithic kind of construction. I could, I'm reading again, I could hear something sluggish that moved in the water and somewhere in the distance was a turning around which light found its way so dimly that it hardly looked like light at all, but more like filmy mist. A heavy monster splashed somewhere beneath us. What the hell? And the Mahatma raised the lantern to peer into our faces. Those are alligators. You may see them now if you would rather. The same is with the snakes. The rule is you must do them no harm. Do them no harm. Okay. So he, he, he keeps taking them through this dark uh, underworld. And, uh, you know, more. we keep, you know, getting description, you know, of this place having been built long ago and how old it is. The chamber, I'm continuing to read, the American narrator in Cave of Terrors, says the chamber was at least a hundred feet long and 30 feet wide its roof was lost in smoke but seemed to be irregular as if the walls of a natural cavern had been shaped by masons who left the high roof as they found it so again using natural subterranean spaces to um take advantage of you know for passageways now the so-called gray mahatma takes them to this place where these guys are being tortured, okay? And he explains who they are. This, uh, just a presumptuous fool, the Mahatma said pleasantly. This was the most presumptuous of them all, but they all suffer for the same offense. Take warning, they could walk away if they cared to. They are here of what they think is their free will. They are, and here's the part, that I think is the message. They are the moths who sought the flames, some from curiosity, some from desire, some craving adoration for themselves. There is not one of these who was not warned. They were cautioned not to inquire into matters too deep for them. Okay? Take care lest curiosity overwhelm you. Now, this could be theater being done by the gray Mahatma to scare off the American and, and the British uh, major king, right? Like, see, this is what happens to those who, you know, how did he put it? Uh, who inquired into matters too deep for them, all right? Uh, take care lest your curiosity overwhelm you. 
Now, um, it, it goes on with even more description. Uh, again, reflective of how old this place is and this technology that you're going to hear about might be. We were evidently in a system of caves that had been quarried into shape centuries before the Christian era. They seemed originally to have been bubbles and blowholes in volcanic rock and to have been connected together by piercing the walls between them. There was certainly no intelligible plan attached to their arrangement, for we went first up, then down, then sideways, losing all sense of elevation and direction. But we passed through at least three score of those connected holes, and the air in some of the higher ones was so foul that breathing it made you weak at the knees. So that, that tells you, you know, how deep they're, they're getting. In each cave was an infinitesimal lamp made of baked clay and fed with vegetable oil that provided more smoke than flame, and the walls and ceiling were deep with the soot of centuries. Okay, and it, and it goes on. We emerged at last under the stars by the side of a great stone tank. It might have been a bathing pool, for along each side steps disappeared into the water. We could dimly distinguish one end on our right hand with a row of great graven gods all reflected in the water, but the other end vanished through a black cave mouth. It was about 120 feet wide from bank to bank. Okay, so it's this massive megalithic underworld that they're being taken through, okay? And it goes on. He stepped down, and this is the Mahatma leading them. He stepped down into the water, and at once it became evident that to all intents and purposes, there were two tanks, the division between them, lying about 18 inches underwater. So they learned the secret to how he moves through, they can move through a pool of alligators. There's dividers that you can't see uh, initially, right, that are just under the surface. But when you get down there, you, you, you can see them and realize, oh, these alligators, you know, they're not going to get me. So that part you know, is a very clever visual trick, right, that they can use for um, initiations. And then it goes on, again, with describing how old this, this place is. The Mahatma led us forward toward a long, dark shadow that transformed itself into a temple wall as we drew closer. And in a moment, we were once more groping our way downward amid prehistoric foundation stones. Downward, prehistoric foundation stones. We came into an enormous crypt that evidently underlay a temple, great pillars of natural rock, practically square and 20 feet thick, supported the roof, which was partly of natural rock and partly of jointed masonry. Now, if you guys have ever seen the salt mines that have opened up, you know, across the country, different places in the world, um, these things go incredibly deep. They have huge pillars, the, 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 right? And, and that's what I was thinking of when it described these pillars 20 feet thick and, and how deep this was. But uh, um, uh, practically square and 20 feet, feet thick supported the roof, which was partly of natural rock and partly of jointed masonry. Okay, so th there is ancient, God knows how old, masonry in here. And this is Mundy talking about this in the 1920s. Certainly he wasn't the first guy to talk about lost temples and how old things were. But what we're talking about here today is Talbot Mundy and his resonance with the works of uh, Joseph Farrell and others a hundred years later in, in these things that we're talking about. I'll continue reading Mundy from Caves of Terror, 1922. But around the crypt, there were more cells than I could count offhand. Some were dark. There were lights burning in the others. Each had an iron door with a few holes in it and a small square window, unglazed and unbarred, cut in the natural rock. So some type of dark, um, what was it, prison, holding cells, slave cells? What was going on there? And then Grey Mahatma, this is quoting him, None but an aspirant has ever entered here, said the Grey Mahatma. Even when India was conquered... No enemy penetrated this place. You stand on forbidden ground. So what is the Mahatma telling them? Okay, the Mahatma is telling them this is such a deep secret, this place he's showing that, that neither the British nor whoever else had conquered India, what we know as India over the centuries, ever even learned about this place hidden away that, that Mundy dramatizes in his novel. 
okay? Th this, what it's saying is there are deep, deep secrets, no pun intended because it is subterranean. Uh, again, is Mundy telling us that it is, it, 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 India wasn't so much ignored in, in Mundy's day? It, it seems to, and, and India's not ignored now. Uh, it's just interesting how, um, with some researchers, they ask the question, you know, where is this stuff? And, I'll, and also with things like the gold and stuff like that. Anyway, it, it's, to me, it's conspicuous that the possibility that some of the answers are in India um, is not mentioned or referred to. Reading on in Monday. There were three bearded men squatting on one mat facing the stone ledge, ledge one of whom held an ancient manuscript. So you got ancient manuscripts here. Um, uh, the three looked up at the gray Mahatma. They eyed King and me with butcher's eye appraisal, nodded and resumed their consultation of the handwritten roll. The characters on it looked like Sanskrit. Okay? So there, of course, are what? The, the very famous and popular lost ancient texts that, you know, people have been really talking a lot about since, what, the, the, the late 19th century, especially with... Uh, Helena Blavatsky and other theosophists and such. Um, Mahatma talks about one guy being driven mad because he made it through the pool of terrors and learned these secrets. Again, a warning. Mundy is having his character give a warning to the Brit, the British character and the American character. Now remember, this is right after World War One, okay? And you had, you know, the British Empire was fading or had faded and you had... The, the American empire on its way, okay? And is this what Mundy is warning, you know, about? Um, that these things, these secrets are dangerous and drive you mad. So um, here's where we must return to Joseph Farrell's Babylon's Banksters, because what I'm about to share with you um, should blow you away. Now, before I read to you from Monday, let's go back to Joseph Farrell's Babylon Banksters, written in 2010. And this is on page 294 in, uh, I believe, his section on conclusions. But it's page 294 under The Reasons for the Banksters' Ancient Associations with the Temple. Okay? Joseph Farrell's talking about the Banksters. Okay, number one, prediction, advanced knowledge of cycles of human activity and emotional responses. Okay, number two, communication. For if males' hypothesis should be borne out by subsequent scientific investigation and experiment, access to the temple would have given them access to a means of virtually instantaneous communication across a great part of the world's surface. Now, instantaneous communication across a great part of the world's surface. So we have to ask ourselves, in Mundy's story, when Yasmini tells him, you know, in the 1860s, okay, when the British had their victory at Kandahar, Bombay, a thousand miles away, knew it the minute it happened. How might they have known it? Let me read to you from Mundy, 1922, and you can listen how it resonates with what Dr. Mayo hypothesized in 2003 and Dr. Farrell refers to in 2010. And I'm reading from chapter five, Far Cities. Now, the gray Mahatma led the way toward one of the great square pillars that supported a portion of the roof. In that pillar, there was an opening about six feet high and barely wide enough for a man of my build to squeeze himself through. But once inside, there was ample space and a stairway hewn in the stone wound upward. We emerged through a wooden door into a temple whose walls were almost entirely hidden by enormous images of India's gods. Uh, however, the gray Mahatma took us instead into this into a marvelous courtyard bathed in moonlight. 
and uh, the air was warm. Okay, they go down into a hole. Okay, with there's a stairway leading them, you know, again back down underneath. Uh, the air was warm but breathable, and there seemed to be plenty of it, as if some efficient means of artificial ventilation had been provided. Nevertheless, it was nothing else than a cavern that we were exploring. The only masonry was the steps. We came to the bottom at last in an egg-shaped cave, in the center of which stood a rock. Um, uh, that, he said, is the last symbol of ignorance. The remainder is knowledge. Now, they come to... The passage, the extraordinary circumstance was the light. The whole passage was bathed in light, yet I could not detect where it came from. It was not dazzling like electricity. No one place seemed brighter than another, and there were no shadows. It's an even illumination, which they can't readily identify the source of. Just like Harold T. Wilkins wrote, you know, people saying that it was found in the 1700s, in lost cities of South America. Okay. Our guide turned to the right. We passed through a door that seemed to open at the slightest touch. Something about the suddenness with which the light had ceased in the passage the moment Mahatma's back was past the door. Now, what's he talking about? I had hung back a little trying to make shadows with my hands to discover the direction of the light. And the strange part was that I could see the bright light in front of me through the open door, but none of it came out in the passage. In other words, he's standing before an open door. Usually when you're standing before a door, you know, you're in a dark hallway and in the room on the other side of the door is fully illuminated. That illumination casts out into the dark hall, right? In this instance, he's saying, no, the hall was completely dark. The room was illuminated. The door was open, okay? It was intuition that caused me to pause at the threshold before following the others through. Something about the suddenness with which the light had ceased in the passage the moment the Mahatma's back was past the door added to my curiosity, made me stop and consider that plane where the light left off. Having no other instrument available, I took off my turban and flapped it to and fro to see whether I could produce any effect on that astonishing dividing line. And for about the 10,000th time in a somewhat strenuous career, it was intuition and curiosity that saved me. The instant the end of the turban touched the plane between light and darkness, it caught fire. Or rather, I should say, fire caught it. And the fire was so intense and swift that it burned off that part of the turban without damaging the rest. In other words, there was a plane of unimaginably active heat between me and the rest of the party of such extraordinary heat that it functioned only on that plane. For I could not feel it with my hand from an inch away. The plane between the fully illuminated room and the dark hallway. J just a thin layer burns the turban with intense heat. 1922, depicting a mysterious technology deep in the subterranean world of, of a, a temple so ancient, it's a mystery. Mundy's writing this stuff in 1922, okay? Folks, he's describing the scale or physics of this goddamn place that's so ancient they don't know how old it is, okay? They could, I'm reading on, Monday. They could hear, however, and I called to King. They could hear, however, and I called to King. I told him what happened and then showed him by throwing what was left of the turban toward him. Now, King is in the lit room, okay? It got exactly as far as the plane between light and darkness, between the illuminated room and the dark hallway, and then vanished in a silent flash so swiftly and completely as to leave no visible charred fragment. Scalar physics, folks. Mundy's writing about this, depicting this in his 1922 novel. Think of Mayo's Hypothesis. I, it, 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 they, they continue on. We were in a chamber roughly 50 feet square whose irregular corners were proof enough that it had been originally another of those huge blowholes in volcanic stone. 
but the greater part of the side walls had been finished off smooth with chisel and hand rub. There was a big rectangular rock exactly in the middle of the room, shaped like a table or an altar, and polished until it shone. Now, before I go further, again, just to, just so you clear on what we're talking about here. Joseph Farrell's Babylon Banksters, reason, okay? The, uh, the, the reasons for the Banksters' ancient association with the temple. Remember, there are four reasons. And um, number two is communication. And it refers to Dr. Mail's hypothesis, a means of virtually instantaneous communication across a great part of the world's surface. And remember, Yasmini in the story says, that Bombay, a thousand miles away from the victory, British victory in Kandahar, knew about the victory the moment it happened in the 1860s. How? You're about to possibly find out within the context of this story. There was a big rectangular rock exactly in the middle of the room, shaped like a table or an altar, and polished until it shone. I decided to sit down on it, and that's when the Mahatma ceased to ignore me. Fool, he barked. Keep off that. I tore a piece off the rag I was wearing for a loincloth and tossed it onto the polished surface of the stone to test it. It vanished instantly and left no trace. It did not even leave a mark on the stone, and the burning was so swift and complete that there was no smell. The Mahatma saved his life. It, it, it was a polished altar, flat rock, okay, that there's this energy that would burn and disintegrate. That's disintegration, folks, what Mundy just described, okay? Now, it gets better. The Mahatma continues. You have seen the camera obscura that shows in darkness the scenery near at hand, provided the sun is shining, the camera obscura is a feeble imitation of the true idea. This is the Mahatma talking. There are no limits to the vision of him who understands true science. What city do you wish to see? The Mahatma asks. Major King, the British officer, says, Banaras. Banaras is a city in India. And I'll continue. Suddenly we were in darkness. Equally suddenly, the whole top surface of the stone table became bathed in light of a different quality, light like daylight that perhaps came upward from the stone. But if so, came only a little way. To me, it looked much more as if it had began suddenly in midair and descended toward the surface of the stone. And there, all at once, as clearly as if we saw it on the focusing screen of a gigantic camera, lay Benares spread before us with all its color, its sacred cattle in the streets, its crowds bathing in the Ganges, temples, domes, trees, movement. Almost the smell of Benares was there, for the suggestion was all-inclusive. But why is it daylight in Benares while it's somewhere near midnight here, King demanded? That instant, the sunshine in Benares ceased and the moon and stars came out. It was far more perfect than a motion picture. Allowing for scale, it looked actually real. What Mundy is describing through his character, they're in this deep subterranean, lost ancient temple with this forgotten technology, forgotten to everybody but those in India who know about it. And, and there, the Mahatma, they take, he, he takes them to this altar of polished stone and asks them, pick a city. And the Brit picks a city and suddenly a, a, a three-dimensional illuminated view of the city from above appears on this table like a some type of three-dimensional television beam showing them the city of Benares and when he asks how come it's not the same time of day as us it cuts to the nighttime view now f 
think about the instant communication across thousands of miles. Is this table how Bombay was aware, according to the story that Mundy's talking about, when Yasmini says Bombay, a thousand miles away from Kandahar, knew of the victory the instant it happened? Did they have this kind of technology? Was that what Yasmini was saying? Okay. Now, it goes on because... Uh, um, and, and he said that it looked actually real, like they were looking at it in real time, live. Okay, the city of Benares. So, um, then that clears off. And the Mahatma says, name another city. London, says Major King. The light went out, and there, sure enough, was London. First the Strand, crowded with motor buses. Then Ludgate Hill and St. Paul's. Then the Royal Exchange and Bank of England. Then London Bridge and the Tower Bridge and a panorama of the Thames. Are you satisfied? The Grey Mahatma asked. Now, of course, King thinks it's a trick of sort, but, you know, with technology, sure. Um, Mahatma answers him, this is a science beyond your knowledge, that is all. Name another city. Here's what's interesting. Timbuktu, this is the American narrator. Timbuktu, I said suddenly, and nothing happened. Mombasa, which is... Uh, is it? Yeah, Mombasa. I said then, and Mombasa appeared instantly. And the key the American figures out is, I had been to Mombasa, whereas I had never seen Timbuktu. This implies that this technology is connected to the human thought process. In other words, any city you've been to you can call it up on this table, and there it is, real time, what's going on there at the moment. That's what Mundy is implying. Yes, this is fiction, but pretty interesting stuff in the, in, you know, the 1920s. Not that he was the only one writing about wild stuff, but think about that. Think about that. So let's go back to Joseph Farrell, Babylon's Banksters, written in 2010. The reasons for the uh, Banksters' ancient associations with the temple, right? And there's four reasons he gives, and one of them is communication. For if male's hypothesis should be borne out by subsequent scientific investigation and experiment, access to the temple would have given them access to a means of virtually instantaneous communication across a great part of the world's surface. That is exactly what Mundy just described they're doing with this magic table, okay, in Caves of Terror. And, and I'll read on. The gray Mahatma said something in a surly undertone, and the golden light turned itself on again, flooding the whole chamber. King nodded to me. You can speak into a phonograph and reproduce your voice. There's no reason why you can't think and reproduce that too, if you know how. In other words, you know, mind control technology, you know, the that that we're we're trying to in in fighter jets, you know, we're we're trying to do targeting where it's all in the pilot's helmet and connected to his brain waves. So, you know, all pilot, he or she has to do is just look at the target and, you know, and they kind of replicated that in a faked way. The Mahatma says, if you know how, India has always known how. What is Mundy saying there? Is he telling us, you know, pay attention to India, don't write it off. The Mahatma goes on, all energy is vibrations, yet that is only one fraction of the truth. All is vibration. The universe consists of nothing else. Your Western scientists are just beginning to discover that, but they are men groping in the dark who can feel but not see and understand. Throughout what all nations have agreed to call the Dark Ages, there have been men called alchemists, whom other men have mocked because they sought to transmute baser metals into gold. Do you think they sought what was impossible? Nothing is impossible. They dimly discerned the possibility. And it may be that their ears had caught the legend of what has been known in India for countless ages. Now we're getting to... Gold is a system of vibrations, just as every other metal is, and the one can be changed into the other. Okay, let me uh, 
stay because I I've got some several notes in here and I'm trying to stay on tonight's specific topic. Oh, and and, and then um, the Mahatma does a little a little alchemical um, demonstration. There were certainly strange looking boxes with hinged lids arranged on a ledge along one side of the chamber. On another ledge on the opposite side of the cell, there were about a hundred rolls of very ancient looking manuscripts. Um, our host went to one of the peculiar looking boxes and selected a lump of what looked like lead. It was a small piece. Um, he dropped it into the middle of the slab of wood and squatted in front of it facing us to watch. I dare say it took 20 minutes for that lump of lead to change into what looked like gold before our eyes. It began by sizzling and melting in little pits and spots, but never once did the whole lump melt. The tiny portions that melted and liquefied became full of motion. Gradually, the whole piece shrank and shrank. At the end, it was not in its original shape, but it had taken the form of a, of a miniature cow's dropping. I suppose it was hot. Our host waited several minutes before picking it up off the slab. At last, he took the nugget off the slab and tossed it to King. King handed it to me. It was still warm, and it looked and felt like gold. The uh, Mahatma then takes him into a cavern that's the biggest one. And... The Mahatma, you know, says, Hey, uh, uh, King asks... Why do you use a temple full of Hindu idols to conceal your science, if it is a natural science and not trickery? The Mahatma says, can you suggest a better way of keeping the secret? We are protected by the superstition. Not even the government of India would dare arouse the superstitious wrath of a people by inquiring too closely into what goes on beneath a temple. So the Mahatma, you know, in, in Mundy's story is saying, yeah, we're hiding this technology, you know, within the, the, the wrappings of a temple, okay? Which is what Joseph Farrell, Joseph Farrell and Scott DeHart and Grid of the Gods certainly talk about, what Joseph Farrell talks about in here, what others have talked about. The, 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 by the way, the Mahatma at one point reveals that he's a PhD, PhD of Johns Hopkins. So when... Uh, When King asks him, they they also do the same thing. Now get this, get this again, the communication, instantaneous communication. Joseph Farrell is talking about. Okay, they take them into another cave. Uh, they were sitting on mats on the floor in no apparent order. Each man had a row of tuning forks in front of him. Every few minutes, one of them would select a fork, strike it, and listen. Then he would get up and sit down somewhere else. Uh, but. It, the tuning forks were not the cause of the din. It was the roar of a great city that was echoing under the dome. Clatter of traffic and men's voices. Dogs barking. The whistle of a locomotive. A railroad train. The Mahatma says, you are hearing Bombay. At one moment, you could hear a man or woman speaking as distinctly as if the individual were up there under the dome. They're in a, they're in a, a, a room with a dome ceiling, like a parabolic... Uh, you know, dish, right? Um, the only continuously recognizable sounds were a power station. Isn't that interesting? This is our latest, said the Mahatma. It is only for two or three hundred years that we have been studying this phenomenon. I wanted to ask questions, but could not because the cursed inharmony made my senses real. Nevertheless, you could hear other sounds perfectly. Now you shall hear another city, the Mahatma said, and they're listening to more. As they turn these forks, they're tuning into cities. Okay, these are, these are giant tuning forks. And as they strike certain ones and turn them a certain way, they're picking up and drawing the actual real-time audio of cities miles away into this structure with the dome parabolic uh, uh, dish if I'm getting that word right, um, up above them, okay? And they're doing it through vibration. And, and it's real time. What is it Joseph Farrell says? Why, why they wanted the temples? Communication, means of virtually instantaneous communication across a great part of the world's surface. And here's Mundy describing just that in this 1922 novel. 
he talks about, without acknowledging the order in any other way, the man got on his knees and picked an, up an enormous tuning fork whose prongs were about three, three, three feet long. And he made some adjustment in the fork of it that took about five minutes. He might have been turning the screw of a micrometer. I could not see. Then raising the fork above his shoulder, he struck the floor with it. And a master note as clear as the peal of a bell went ringing up into the dome, which is above their heads. The effect was almost ridiculous. It made you want to laugh. That one note chased all the others out of the dome as a dog might chase sheep. That one clear master note, the middle F. If Joseph is here, he's a musician, maybe he can tell us the significance of the middle F. That one clear master note, the middle F, went vibrating around and around. As if uh, the Mahatma says, that is the keynote of all nature. So Mundi is saying through his story, the Mahatma is telling them that the middle F is the keynote of all nature. All sounds, all colors, all thoughts, all vibrations center in that note. It is the key that can unlock them all, the middle F. The silence that followed when the last ringing was the most absolute and awful silence I have ever had to listen to. The very possibility of sound seemed to have ceased to exist. So when, when the tuning forks aren't being worked, the silence is incredible. It's profound. There was a feeling that these men were fooling with the force that runs the universe and that the next stroke might be a mistake that would result like the touching off of two high-tension wires multiplied to the nth. You could not resist the suggestion that the world might burst in fragments at any minute. Doesn't that sound like Tesla stuff there? Okay. Maybe that's where Mundy, you know, was inspired is his knowledge of Tesla. Nikola Tesla. I'm reading again from Monday. Meanwhile, the fellow with the tuning fork fiddled again with some adjustment on the thick portion of its stem, and presently whirling it around his head, he brought it down on one of the circle of small anvils that were arranged around him like figures on a clock face. You could almost see Calcutta instantly. Uh, discordant note he struck was swallowed instantly in a sea of noise that seemed not only to have color, but even smell to it. You could hear the crows that sit on the trees in the park. There was the click of ponies' hooves, the whirring and honk of motor cars, the booming of a steamer whistle, roars of trains. In the sea of noises in the dome, one instantly stood out, the voice of a man speaking English with a slight accent. For exactly as long as the reverberations of those two tuning forks lasted, you could hear him talking, and then his voice faded away. So with these two tuning forks vibrating in conjunction in this chamber with the parabolic, you know, uh, uh, surface, okay? They're able to pick out a specific person's voice, okay, from miles away. Talbot Mundy, 1922, Caves of Terror. And yet, Joseph Farrell and Doc, Dr. Mayle speak of an instantaneous communication associated with some type of hidden technology embedded in temples. What did Mundy know, and when did he know it, and from where did he, he know it? And I've got some more stuff here to start. The gray Mahatma instantly began striking those two forks as rapidly as he were clapping hands, increasing the, with vehemence, the vehemence with each stroke. If I had stayed there, I would have been stark mad or dead within five minutes. I felt as if I were being vibrated asunder. I lay on the floor with my head in both hands and I dare say yelled with agony. So these things, the Mahatma is demonstrating the horrific, the horrific potential of them being weaponized. And then King drags him through a passage. No one sound reached us through the open door. They had learned the way of absolutely localizing noise. Now, before, they had learned a way of localizing light. And now he takes him right outside the door. And just like the earlier passage where the room is lit, but the passage is pitch dark, right? And there was the burning plane in between. The similar thing with sound, Mundy says in this, that... The, the the deadly sound that was reverberating inside the chamber, once he gets outside in the corridor, 
they don't hear it at all. So again, more advanced technology with scalar physics. By generating this plane between the, the corridor and the chamber, the, the sound does not escape. Localizing noise. Let me see. Oh, I think that might be as far as I intended to go. Yeah, in this book. Okay, so there you see how Talbot Mundy's Caves of Terror resonates with something very specific that Joseph Farrell's talking about in Babylon's Banksters regarding technology of ancient you know, a lost technology of these very ancient temples, okay? Now, why the importance of the banksters? Well, we get into that in The Nine Unknown, okay? This is the 1923 novel that followed Caves of Terror. And in this, let me see what else I've got. Um, yeah, I'll come back to that. Because I think, oh, oh, by the way, by the way, he refers to, remember, Mundy's talking about the alchemy that was demonstrated in the story? Well, Farrell writes, um, the same pattern holds as well during the interim period between ancient and modern times. For during that period, one finds the persistent interest of the royal houses in Europe in alchemy, the ability to transmute base metals into gold. Now, alchemy, you know, transmuting lead into gold, that, that's an old thing, okay? I'm not saying it's original with Mundy. What I'm saying is, is how Mundy associates it specifically with the ancient temple and this forgotten technology, which is so exact to what specifically Farrell and by, you know, extension, um, uh, uh, Professor Mayle, Dr. Mayle hypothesized in 2003 as well. It is, I just thought that was interesting, okay, that that's in there too. But let's go to the nine unknown now and allow me to read the pertinent parts to you. Now, the nine unknown, a uh, very interesting book by Talbot Mundy. You've probably, if you're familiar with Theosophy and Elena Blavatsky and all that, you've heard of the nine unknown men, and this is kind of a, this is Mundy kind of playing on that. Now, remember I told you, Mundy spent time in um, San Diego, where Loma Land was, and uh, in uh, Tinsley, Miss Madam Tinsley, where at, and, and there, were the, there was Theosophy there. And, uh, you know, they talked about the, the nine unknown men who controlled um, this lost technology and knowledge of it. And uh, in the novel, Mundy has uh, this, this crazy priest, Father Cyprian, who um, is uh, so devoted to keeping this dangerous information from the world that he's dedicated to getting the information and destroying it. Now, in this particular story, The Nine Unknown, uh, also, folks, I publish these books. These editions you get at lulu.com, okay? Um, go to lostcontentlibrary.com. You can find links to a couple of them there. But if you go to lulu.com, where I sell my books, these, this edition, these are the editions you want. Now, in Mundy's book, The Nine Unknown, You've got the nine unknown who are the mysterious nine men. But you got these two groups. One of them, you got the, the so-called bad group, which is run by thuggies and, and Kali worshipers who are dedicated to chaos. And they want the books for its destructive power. Uh, Father Cyprian, he's put together a team that um, he sends out to get the books so he can destroy them. He's obsessed with destroying the books. Now, I find that interesting because that isn't that just like, um, isn't that just like a churchianity priest wanting to destroy? Think of during the um, Spanish conquest of Latin America. What did the priests do? Oh, we got to destroy, right? All the the ancient books, okay, of the Inca and so forth, right? Christianity 
you know, they they really went through their period of let's just destroy all traces before our presence so that we can dominate. And this is what I, I believe Mundy is saying with Father Cyprian. He's saying, look, here's another asshole, you know, from churchianity that wants to destroy the past because, it, you know, it, it, it's competition, okay? And Cyprian is one of these churchianity obsessives. And I know I'm, I'm, you know, ruffling the panties of, uh, you know, some of you folks out there because uh, oh, how dare I say that on Easter Sunday? Mm, okay, whatever. That's a whole other discussion. But um, you know, truth is the truth. Suck it up. So Father Cyprian represents the mad, crazed, um, envious, um, errant priest who um, just just can't deal with, you know, something that's older than his own tradition that he's devoted to. So he wants to erase it and destroy it under the guise of altruism, blah, 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 BS. Um, so basically he sends his team out. Now here's what's interesting about the team. The team includes Major King from Caves of Terror and King of the Kyber Rifles. It also includes Jim Grimm, one of Mundy's other legendary characters. And, um, oh my gosh, let's see. Uh, uh, Ramsden, who's another Mundy character from his books. And um, Jeremy Ross, the Australian hero. Now, these are all heroes from various Mundy novels and stories. And he brings them all together in The Nine Unknown. And they're working for Father Cyprian. And they soon learn, oh, wow, he's nuts. Why destroy this stuff, you know? Um but they soon they're sent out to get these books before the bad guys get them so that Father Cyprian can destroy them. Okay? So um one of the early things we have is um this Portuguese character. Uh and here's a comment. Surely ancient science has meant nothing to them, yet it was pursuit of ancient science and of nothing else that brought the Twelve together. So that tells you what, you know, is, is going on with why, what's really going on with this story. Now, here's what jumped out at me. And again, we're talking about, when you're talking about these books that the, the nine unknown men are control of, um, uh, n let's see, he... In the pursuit of this, there are some coins they're talking about. None was a more recent date but, and than a thousand years. They're talking about all this, this old stuff. Now, here's what's interesting. Here's what, again, brings us what brought to mind Babylon's banksters to me. Uh, Mundy writes, uh, Jim Grimm, the American, got a telegram from his employer. And the, the, the telegram says, investigate and report on perpetual disappearance of specie in India. Specie meaning currency. Okay, this is 1923. Mundy's talking about games with currency. Investigate and report on perpetual disappearance of currency specie in India from Meldrum Strange, that, that M that I told you about, Mundy's M. Okay, and... and It's further explained here. We want to discover what has happened to the billions of dollars worth of gold and silver that has been won from the earth during the thousands of years since mining was first commenced. The cash in circulation doesn't account for 1% of it. Where is the rest? Jim Grimm says, Father Cyprian wants the nine books. He wants to destroy the knowledge that has enabled certain unknown men for thousands of years to drain the world of its supply of gold and silver. I wish to discover where the gold and silver is. Here we have Talbot Mundy talking about this, where the hell is the gold? Where really is it? Who's hoarding it, right? Who's actually keeping it? And, and uh, you know, they go on. It's like, okay, you got to get the books and, and so forth. And um, the coins are important because it's evidence that, you know, the gold does exist. But um, let's see. They're talking about the, the, the nine and how it's structured. They're asking, how old is this organization? 
And the answer is, how old is India? There is wisdom in the books the nine make use of. One book to a man, each book dealing with a branch of wisdom. They have simply hoarded money. So this mysterious group in Mundy's world here is suspected of hoarding the money, the gold. And it, and it goes on. Nevertheless, one character says, India continues swallowing gold and silver in measures of quarries, that which is swallowed not repairing in any discernible shape. In other words, they, they, they're taking in the gold and, and silver, but they're not putting it back out in circulation. There's no product. There's no coinage. What, what are they doing with this money? Not reappearing in any discernible shape, contrary to teachings of political economy. Okay, so there's Mundy going into economy and, and economic uh, philosophy. Um, let, me, let me start again. India continues swallowing gold and silver in measures of quarries, that which is swallowed not reappearing in any discernible shape, contrary to teachings of political economy, which being the religion of the West, is probably poppycock possessing priests with checkbooks and top hats. Where is gold and silver? That is the whole point. The Portuguese says Babylon had gold and silver. Where is it? Always India has imported gold and silver. Always. But where is it? Mundy writes. The balance, the accumulated surplus of at least 6,000 years. I estimate, it, I estimate it as a heap as great as the Pyramid of Giza. And where is it? Right? What became of the gold of Solomon? Da Gama asked. I, for one, to come answer, continue on, but there are books, as Cyprian the Priest. Where is the gold the Spaniards and the Portuguese shipped home from South America and Mexico? Where is all the product of the Rand and of Australia? They took seven billions of dollars worth of gold and silver from the Comstock, just one reef in Nevada. Yet tell me, how much gold and silver is there in the world today? The greatest hoard, greater than all other known hoards put together, is in the United States Treasury, and it doesn't amount to a hatful compared to the total that is known to have been mined in the course of history. Where has the rest disappeared? This is Mundy asking this question through a novel in 1923. The Portuguese goes on to say, show me the books of Cyprian the priest, and I will tell you where the treasure is. See, this Portuguese guy is trying to get his hands on the books that Father Cyprian has already collected and is hoarding, because he's going to burn them, but he's hoarding these, this knowledge. Sounds like the Vatican, right? You know? Priests who go around the world collecting ancient knowledge, and then they hoard it. It sounds like what the Vatican does with their library, right? Stuff the rest of us aren't allowed to see, okay? If they're not burning it, they're keeping it for themselves. Father Cyprian, in my opinion, this is Monday, um, you know, Father Cyprian represents the Roman Catholic Church, represents the Vatican and the Vatican Library. But this, this Portuguese guy in the story, he knows how to read the texts, which Father Cyprian does not. And what he's trying to do is make a deal. Okay, show me the books of Cyprian the priest and I will tell you where the treasure is. The Portuguese guy believes that the secret of where all this gold is being kept and who's hoarding it is in the books. You know, so, uh, but uh, my point of all this is here is Talbot Mundy in a 1923 novel asking the questions that I've asked in, in um, you know, a couple of my books you know, the Secret Mission series and Origin. Um, certainly, Mundy is talking in the 1920s in fiction about things that are in this book, okay, and other works that Joseph Farrell has uh, discussed, the, you know, the, the secrets and conspiracies and the mysteries of um, currency and, and gold and such. Um, now, in... The Nine Unknown, there's more to go here, but I've, I've gone almost 100 minutes. The time has just sped by. I think I'm going to have to jump into this, because um, believe me, Mundy goes even deeper into these things we're talking about, um, you know, with the currency throughout, you know, in, in a later portion of this book. Um, but it, 
it deserves. Let me see here. There might be. A couple, it deserves, you know, another episode talking about the stuff in the Nine Unknown and others. But um, basically, what you've got here is Mundy. He's talking about this lost technology, okay? These this very old technology, and um, now yes, in our time, there's people that um, that of course talk about the mysteries of India and such. But in some conversations, you know, still India doesn't come up, and and I find it interesting that Mundy was um, talking about India, this lost technology and the gold and and all this stuff. Um, within the same context that we in our community, Alternative Research, are discussing it today, but he was talking about it a hundred years ago, okay? And because it's in fiction, it goes ignored by, you know, people, look, never assume you know it all, okay? God knows we got a lot of people in our times that they know it all, just ask them, particularly in America, and even more specifically in this community. My God, uh, you know, God bless them all. This community is classic for that. You guys know that bullshit, I tell you, that, that men do, particularly American men, but men do that that whole philosophy of, eh, even if you don't know, act like you do, because that's what a man does. That cocksurety bullshit. And that's what what I think is going on when when I tell you pay more attention to some of the fiction out there and it goes ignored, okay? Because all these cocksure people, they know what's going on. And how many times does that prove wrong? Does cocksurety, you know, get people in trouble, you know, as far as what they know and what they don't know? And um, anyway, um, It, uh, on the last page of Joseph's book, Babylon's Banksters, there is written, um, so, you know, he writes something that I think really is a commentary on what Mundy, you know, particularly in Caves of Terror, what I, I read for you with the technology and such. Joseph writes on page 296 of Babylon's Banksters, Joseph Farrell writes, while many have guessed at the motivations for this vast and ancient conspiracy, no one seems to have approached anything like a final answer. I certainly cannot claim to have done so either, but an answer does suggest itself from the preceding pages, namely, that they are indeed trying to reconstruct a lost mythical past. A global golden age with a supremely sophisticated science with which they can dominate and subjugate the earth. But to reconstruct it on the scale required and implied by their enterprise itself will require that virtually the entire planet and its resources must be at their disposal. This very thing that Joseph wrote in 2010 is what Talbot Mundy is writing about in his fiction a hundred years ago. Okay? And there's more where this came from. This is only two of the four Monday novels that I'm offering in classic reprint at lulu.com, these editions right here. There's two more. And there's other stories of his that I'll, I'll be offering classic reprints, and I'll be talking about whether I'm offering them or not, okay? Um, but uh, I, I think Monday is much more important in this pursuit than you realize. And I'm telling you, stop discounting something just because it's in fiction, Okay? Things are hidden. Easter eggs are hidden everywhere. I've told you I do this in my fiction. I put stuff in there that just won't fit properly in the nonfiction. So, you know, go ahead, be, you know, show your cocksurity, be ignorant, and ignore fiction. Or pay attention to it and come away with more knowledge than, you know, the guy next to you who thinks he knows it all. So I'm going to open it up to questions. I want to see the chat. Oh boy. Uh, Malia is here <laughs> and she might help me. So, okay, folks, I'm not even going to bother to go back and try to read all the comments because I didn't have them on, but you know the score. Please put your questions in all caps so that I can see them. If it's not in all caps, I'm not going to read it. Okay. So please. 
So far, you don't have any. What's that? So far, you don't have any. Are they stunned? They're all stunned. 85 people in there. 43. Um, let's see some all caps comments or questions. If you guys don't have any, that's okay. If I've stunned you, run over to lulu.com and get my editions, my company's editions, LCL's editions of these Talbot Mundy classic reprints. You know, you'll be glad you did. Um, Todd Wood says, great talk. I'm going to have to get myself some Mundy audiobooks. We'll let Todd know where those are available, and maybe I'll start his collection for him. Johnny Side says he's stunned. I'm stunned. I've stunned Johnny Side. Yeah, I agree with that. That's not in caps, but Rat Nose Terry, I agree with you. Admiralty Law is a very interesting. Uh, Jeff Limpert, not stunned. It was a good ride. Good. Hey, folks, and I'm not saying I'm not one. Uh, I'm not saying that I'm the only person who is on to Monday and no, I'm just sharing it with you. Okay. Um, I, but I am impressed that Monday was going into the stuff that was resonant with what Joseph Farrell's been trying to tell you for several years. That boy, yes, sir, asks, did you hear about the denouncement of doctrine of discovery? What does that have to? I, I'm not sure about that one. What, what what is that? Could you give me some context yeah. there? And sure. and folks, we're staying on the subject of what I was talking about. I if there's stuff that has to do with the politics going on, for God's sake, you guys know the rules around here. Yeah. Right now, it's all I'll about. I'll tell you the next one. Okay, go ahead. If you want to close that, so you can see yourself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, well, B Baker says. Yeah. yeah. Also, is there actually gold in Fort Knox? That's a good question. That's a very good question. Would they really hide it there? Isn't that kind of obvious? Hey, look, our gold is here, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So. Slick Dissident says, Walter, so grateful. Please continue in the nine unknown. Oh, yeah, I definitely will. There's going to be a future. There's going to be more talk about Mr. Mundy. Believe me. And by the way, Talbot Mundy is going to be included in the literary tours um, affiliated with my research and other things that Malia's company is going to be offering in, in featuring. So when we get the tours up, we haven't talked about it much, right? Have you talked about the magazine yet? I have not. Yes, I did. Well, let's do it again. But, but remember, one. Lost Continent Library Magazine is out there. I told you guys about it. It's at lulu.com. It's a PDF download. Folks, it's only a buck ninety-nine. but believe me, that's next to nothing for the quality of what was done to make that. And starting with the next issue, there's going to be a bunch of new articles and things in it and stories and yeah. such. Yeah. So Brian Evans says, awesome connections, Walter. Thank you, Brian. Yeah, I tell you, and it's the connections that really made themselves apparent through Monday's work and, and you know, our friend Dr. Farrell's work. Can I um, have a little freedom of speech at the moment? Yeah. All right. Shan, Jack, we're on a phone, not a computer. Oh, for Thank God's you. sake. Are, is somebody bitching about audio? <laughs> no. Telling you you can control plus to make your text bigger. Give me a freaking... Oh. Oh, get me started. I thought it was more. I thought it was more complaint about <laughs> audio. Oh my God, no. Yeah, I'm. I'm having to do this from a phone. Who was that, Sam? San Jack. San Jack. Yeah, I'm having to do this from a phone because I'm not at home. I'm in Montana. I'm. I'm on a research trip and work trip. Just and, a little bone right there. Yeah. So. <laughs> so yeah, where I'm having to do this from the phone. So it's you know, and besides, I like having Malia here. You know, read these off. <laughs> That's it for now. That's it? Give her away. Yeah. Wow. Tell a bad joke. That usually helps. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay, well, hey, guys, seriously, I am so glad you guys were here. 90 people. Wow. Um, and this is this is a holiday. This is sun, This is Easter Sunday. I, I appreciate you guys, you know, coming on Easter Sunday to watch. We can announce Dr. Farrell coming up now, right? Oh, yes. Folks, in case I forget, um, May 17th. May 17th, we're having another episode of Trans-Temporal Warfare, and Dr. Joseph Farrell will be here at the Walter Bosley Channel discussing again Trans-Temporal Warfare. 
Do not miss this. If you don't know what I'm talking about, go back to the lives from about a, six weeks ago or whatever and watch the first one with Dr. Farrell and Sesha Ree and others. And um, I'm putting together an interesting smaller panel this time to be part of the discussion. Um, you guys are going to not want to miss this one. It's during the week. I believe it's a Wednesday. All right. So Slick Dissident says, do you think the nine unknown have a connection to nine worthies, nine Daves, or the order of the nine? I, I think thematically they do. If uh, To the extent that all of these have anything to do with what Helena Blavatsky and, and the other theosophists and such uh, refer to, um, a lot of times that's the source of it, is this nine unknown. And certainly Mundy was referring to those um, sources and that legend, okay? Because he was associated with the Theosophists of San Diego at Loma Land and, you know, Madame Tinsley and um, others. So, yeah. Jonaside asks a very good question. With the Mundy books being 100 years ago, what do you think of the C.W. Chanter nostalgia loops? Do you think this info is coming back around? Oh, I C.W. Chanter's, um, uh, what, it, what are they, time loops? Nostalgia time Yeah, the loops. nostalgia time loops. Mm -hmm. You guys look for those videos. Look, go go over to CW's channel, and and do the search, the scroll if he still got them posted. That is outstanding information and exercises in in yeah. Um, I highly recommend considering CW's nostalgia loops, um, and certainly when you're talking a hundred years ago, uh, when you're talking factors of twenty years, yeah. Yeah, I, I would say that it could qualify um, for uh, uh, CW's uh, hypothesis. Absolutely. Todd Wood says, the nine unknown reminds me of the seance of the nine. Yeah, right? Right? <laughs> yeah, there's, well, we know the mystic properties of the number nine, right? Um, River Dogma Pitbull says, hey, River Dogma. at Walter, have you seen the series Alfred Peabody, Batman's Butler? I found it to be a fun poke at MK Ultra and other conspiracy subjects for the Times. Oh, that's interesting. No, I have not. I have not seen that. We can go ahead and open it up to any any topic at all if you guys like. If you have a question other than the Talbot Mundy discussion is fascinating to me. Um, but if there's anything else any of you want to ask about, feel free. Gary Mares says, Walter is a king of awesome, no, mysteriousness. I was going to say awesomeness, but <laughs> you know that <laughs> already. <laughs> Rendella Wenzel says, awesome. That was a great show. Nance Hardwick says, that was re revelatory. Revelatory. Yes. Jeff Ward says, do you have any thoughts on Judy Wood's 9-11 technology? Oh, oh, do I? Yeah. Uh, my thought is that you all need to get her book um, and consider that thesis. Seriously consider it. Um, I lean heavily towards it. That's about it. Mysteriousness. Can't be mirrors. Yeah, so. <laughs> Well, folks, my gosh, it's been almost two hours and it didn't seem like it to me, but this has been, uh, I've really enjoyed talking about this with you guys. And there's going to be more. There's going to be more Talbot Mundy discussion because I, I, I think he was, um, he was on to something. He was on to the very same things that interest us about lost technology, about India. Um, I would venture to say that, you know, he was on to the same things that Cremo and Thompson when they wrote Forbidden Archaeology and, and their views on ancient India. Um, I can never pronounce the guy's name and I apologize, but there's a guy who's got a channel on YouTube here that, that goes and, and talks about all the temples in India from an alternative research angle. And I apologize for not being able to say his name properly, but I know you guys know him, many of you. But if, you know, check him out. Um, really interesting stuff. You don't always have to agree with him, okay? Just like you don't have to agree with me, you don't have to agree with Dr. Farrell, you don't have to agree with CW on the nostalgic time loops. We don't always have to agree on every little thing. Um, it's just the discussion itself that is worthy to get us to start thinking outside of the boxes on things. Um, 
Um, Stephanie Ramirez says Axis Mundi, <laughs> like the Axis Mundi and Mundi. Oh yeah, yeah. It's it. What, you know, and what's interesting <coughs> is um, Mundy's real name was, I think, Edward Gribben. Yeah, Talbot Mundy was a pen name. So, you know. M L says, "When will you finish your project about traveling between parallel universes?" I'm not sure on that one. Is that one of the discussions I've had in the last month since we revamped? Uh, I would I would ask ML to be a little more specific. Yeah, specify ML. Be, but by the way, I can tell you ML based on just what you're asking about the topic alone. Yeah, I'd be talking about that. I'll be continuing that. But if you're talking about a specific project, kind of be a little more specific, refresh my memory on the specific project. The answer is probably yes, but... Uh, Brian Evans says, outstanding post, Walter, and all in chat. Stephanie Ramirez says, Walt, checked out Old World Florida yet? Not yet. Um, Seshery did some great analysis of Florida in the handprint of Atlas, and by extension, he did some more for me, and I've referred to it in some of my works. In fact, Secret Missions 1 the one about California that really is just as much about the Templars coming to North America and going across the continent with their vaults as it is about California and Cabrillo. Um, I talk about specifically uh, Florida geomantic mysteries and such um, in Secret Missions 1, the hidden history of old California. Yeah, and Slick Dissident is asking that we review some um, comments from earlier. So I just wanted to okay. mention we normally go after the stream and review comments. Yes, we do. So you guys know we do go through that and see your see your stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yep. That's it. Um, Brian Evans, one love. Hey, Brian Evans, thank you. Well, folks, I think that's enough Walter Bosley for anybody in one evening. And Malia's got to put up with me now for the several more days, <laughs> so as she usually does, but. I want to thank all of you for being here again. I'm glad you liked this topic. Um, we will be returning to Talbot Monday. And um, again, go to lulu.com to, uh, to get these editions. These are the classic reprints that I have uh, put out there. There's two others. There's Winds of the World and um, The Eye of Zytoon. Um, which, by the way, Talbot Monday was the first writer uh, to um, discuss one of the first writers, if not the first fiction writer, to put to put out the Armenian genocide to the public's eye instead of it being ignored like it was by historians and the media. Um, he, the Eye of Zaytun, you know, that kind of I, I guess you'd say exposes, but he certainly wrote about it for what it was—a genocide. Um, so this this was a guy who. <coughs> This was a guy who paid attention, okay? Talbot Mundy paid attention to real world things. So maybe you ought to pay attention to his fiction. Now, I will pull this comment for sure. Yes. I know you'll like this. Ring Bearer 1420 says, any thoughts on Jewel, Jules Verne's fiction in regards to Mundy's? Oh, God. <laughs> yeah, you're going to hear me talk about Jules Verne also more because um, Verne, it was believed, was being fed... Um, real information about uh, hidden technologies and such. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I'll be talking about Jules Verne more in, in the future, absolutely. So, anyway, that should be it. Thanks again, everybody. My, my voice is worn out, and uh, I will um, see you next Sunday. But look for me jumping on this week in little places here around Montana that I visit but definitely the live stream again next Sunday. So you guys have a good night, and uh, we'll see you next week.